or it can stay the same. Well, in any large complex system, staying the same is not a stable option. Okay, you might think that, well, it could gain a little, lose a little, gain a little, and kind of stay constant, you know, on an average, but that doesn't happen. That's short-term uh, stable, but not long-term stable. Large systems that can change will either eventually evolve or de-evolve. So it's your choice there, if you're one of those systems, is to evolve or die. That's the choice, which means you decrease entropy or die. Okay, individual consciousness evolves toward lower states of entropy, and that's equivalent to saying higher quality consciousness or more spiritual states. So then we'll take a, one step from that and say that love is, the net, is the, uh, a description of a low entropy consciousness. That's what love is. Love is a low entropy consciousness. Okay, now you can think about that. That makes sense. Love is cooperative. It's about other. It's about caring. That builds, constructs, watches out for each other. You know, you can see that as kind of a building, constructing thing. Where on the other side, you have fear, you have hysteria, you have anxiety, you have all of that sort of thing. And instead of being about other, it's about self. It's all about me and mine, as opposed to building anything constructive. It's about me making sure I get hold of mine. That tends to pull things apart. That's not cohesive and doesn't build. So you can see that uh, love is the direction of evolution in consciousness. You lower the entropy of consciousness, you're moving toward love. Okay, attributes of consciousness. Input, that's experience. Memory, if you didn't have memory, every input would be the first. Processing, you have to be able to look at that experience that you get from input and assess it. Purpose, that's how you assess it. You assess it against a purpose and you have to be self-modifying. Okay, those are the basic attributes. Now think about these attributes. They describe exactly our biological systems as well. Think of those uh, biological cells. Say uh, when the cells, the, the first cell if you like, or maybe the first little groups of multi-celled creatures that are in the primordial sea someplace, what did they have to have? They had to have connection to their environment, right? They had to interact with their environment. That's the input. They had to have memory. Now it wasn't intellectual memory, it was just cellular memory. But they had to have memory, otherwise they'd never know, you know where they'd been, whether things were, were better or not. They had to have purpose. That was to procreate and survive. That was their, their purpose, which means lower their entropy. And they had to be self-modifying. If they weren't self-modifying, well, we wouldn't be here, right? They'd still be just those few little cells. They had to be able to change themselves against their purpose, survive and, and uh, multiply, against the data, which was coming from the environment, against their input. Okay, so as it turns out, this input memory processing purpose and self-modifying is a description of consciousness. It's also a description of life. That describes, those are the qualifications for sentience. Okay, anything that's sentient, anything that has, that can react and interact, okay, has to have these, these, uh, these things. Well, what else does that remind you of? Input, memory, processing? Sounds kind of like your desktop computer, doesn't it? Till we get down to the last two with purpose and self-modifying. But someday those two will be overcome as well. We will one day probably see conscious computers. Um, anyway, um, drop that bomb and just move on. Um, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that later if you like. All right, let's do it. Let's do a summary. Um, Summary. Consciousness is best modeled as a superset. Got the summary? Good. Uh, a self-modifying digital information system capable of computing virtual realities. The larger conscious system evolves by lowering the entropy of the system. It lowers the entropy of the system by organizing bits at its disposal to more profitable configuration. Just summarizing all the things we just said. Feedback of the results of previous choice allows to modify future choice. That's free will. Next, let's find out where we come from. Okay, we're, we're, what are we here, consciousness? Uh, because experience, okay, is the generator of input. In order to have the experience, you need interaction with something. Experience comes from interaction. Well, if you have one monolithic consciousness, the only thing it can interact with, the only thing it can have experience with is itself. That's extremely limiting. So just like those biological cells that decided to split and start to evolve multi-celled things, which were lower entropy, more order, right, more construction, more things working for the whole. Same with consciousness. Consciousness divides itself into pieces so those pieces can interact 
with each other, with free will. Now you have, let's say, thousands of smaller things all interacting with free will. Suddenly, your ability to have novelty and to have experience that you can grow from, that you can lower your entry from, is much, much greater, much more experience instead of just one thing interacting with itself. Okay, so that's what we are. We're those chunks of consciousness. We're one of those chunks of consciousness. And now you see that we, just our existence, what we're here for is to lower our entropy, evolve toward love, right? That tells you your purpose. And we're also, it tells you that we are part of the system, but the system now is the larger consciousness system. We're part of that system's way of evolving, right? It, we're, we're, it's strategy to evolve. Okay, so as we evolve and lower our entropy, the whole system lowers its entropy because any part of the system lowers, lowers its entry by a smidgen, the whole system has its entropy lowered by that smidgen. So we're part of the strategy of the larger system. It's evolution. All right, that tells you our purpose, positive direction of that purpose. That defines what's negative, what's positive, what's good, what's bad, what's moral and immoral. Okay? What's positive and good and moral are all those things that lead to decreasing the energy, moving toward love. What's negative, bad, and immoral are all those things that do the opposite, that increase the entropy of your personal consciousness. It breaks out real easily like that, and a, a logical break out of that's done in, the, in my forum. There's a, there's a thing in there that's a, a moral code that kind of lays all that out and uh, how, that, how that works. We don't have time for that now. That would be more than two hours just by itself. Um, okay, now we've got us. Then what about physical reality? Where does physical reality come from? Well, to produce an effective, profitable interaction, you need two things. You need a goal. Well, we've got a goal. Lower the entropy. But you also need constraints. Why do you need constraints? Constraints give us strategy, logic, order, feedback, learning. You can't learn without constraints. Think of a kindergarten class with no constraints. What would, you, what would they learn? They'd learn to be wild, right? Anarchists is what they'd learn. Okay, there's, you need constraints to learn. Think of a game. Let's say you're, you're a player with three other people, four people sitting down playing cards, and there are no rules. Okay, what's your strategy? How do you learn? How do you know who's winning? You know, you can't. Without constraints, without rules, it's impossible. You can't get any traction on it. Without rules, basically all you have is chaos. Evolution is difficult or impossible. Okay, so now this reality then is an elementary school. This is our schoolhouse. It has rules. What's the rules? Physics. That's what scientists do. Our rules are our science. Science goes out and tries to discover what the rules are. Okay, so the rule sets are physics. Um, all right. Now, in order for a virtual reality, like our physical reality, to be effective, okay, consciousness must be able to roughly predict what's going to happen next. And I'll see you, I, I can uh, show you later why, why that's so. Okay, that information is important because it provides feedback and it's important to render this reality is used as a tool. So the consciousness has to know, has some rough idea what's going to happen next. We have free will, so nobody can really know what's going to happen next because we can do things that are unexpected. But because we're in a virtual reality, then how do virtual realities work? They all work the same way. Now, you've probably bumped up against virtual realities before, at least if you know any kids you have. You know, uh, my son played World of Warcraft, so I know about World of Warcraft because he was constantly at the computer when he should have been doing his homework. My daughter played The Sims. You know, both of those are virtual reality games, multiplayer virtual reality games that you've either played or you probably know somebody that's, that's played them. Well, they all work the same way. We are a virtual reality who then creates other virtual reality games, you see. Um, okay, um, the way virtual reality works, the way any dynamic simulation works is you have the simulation and then you step it by time. So you, time, let's say we start right now and the time is something. Well, then you increase that time by a delta t, just a little bit more, and then you go back through the simulation again and say, okay, what happens if time's incremented a little bit? Then you increase the delta t, you go back through it, increase the, you're in a time loop. It's called the outer time loop that drives the simulation. All dynamic simulations are, are done that way. Well, so is ours. 
So is uh, World of Warcraft. 